thank you for the Research Libraries UK for having us today tell you a little bit more about our research and the workshops we've been doing and trying to um, get engaged with AI. Um, so we're gonna tell you a little bit about engaging with artificial intelligence, uh, specifically in research libraries and university libraries. Um, so this is us, as you've seen already. Um, and this is just to give you a sense of the research that we've conducted so far. So we have quite an extensive um, research program um, and we've done several of these steps already. So we've started with an environmental scan, which Amanda will tell you more about, um, to see what the state was in academic libraries right now. How prepared are they for AI? What kind of initiatives are they doing? Um, and then we engaged in a survey of librarians' perceptions of artificial intelligence. Like how do librarians conceive of it? What do they think it is? Um, the impact it could have on the profession and the different services that we offer. So this is kind of where we're at. Um, next steps we want to engage in and we've started doing already is some device testing. So testing virtual um, assistants like a Google Home or Siri on your phone, uh, the Amazon Alexa and seeing how well can they answer reference questions. Um, so we've done a bit of that testing already, um, but we like to kind of involve students and other librarians in that process. So um, because of COVID, we unfortunately cannot do that at the moment, but hopefully we will be able to engage in that soon. Um, and then we also want to survey students' perceptions of AI, like how do our students think about it um, and what impact do they think it will have for their research process and information seeking behaviors. Um, and do some more device testing with the students. So we're sort of at the midway point of our plan um, and pending COVID restrictions being lifted, we'll be able to continue engaging in these. Um, so I'll turn it over to Amanda, who will tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think actually a huge part that we should probably preface is our, our really our fascination with virtual assistants um, or voice assistants, digital assistants, however you're gonna call them. Um, so one of the things that we were really interested in the way that you can use these devices to seek out information and the shift uh, toward like voice queries, I guess. And so we wanted to see how well these devices were actually capable of answering reference questions. That's a huge kind of part of where that device testing is. And um, so one of the interactive things we're going to do today is actually test some of that out of it. So hopefully that will be a little bit fun. Um, but to provide a little bit of context, um, we came up with our own working AI definition. If you've been trying to seek out AI definitions in the past, then you'll know that this is a really convoluted and uh, contentious kind of area. A lot of experts don't agree on what a definition of AI should be. And so we like to actually think this is our living definition. We've added it, I think, like two or three times now where we've shifted around things, taken out words, added new concepts. Um, but our working definition is that we define AI um, as uh, the development of machines to accomplish tasks and reproduce the processes that are normally seen in humans, and that the simulation of intelligent behavior is unique from other automations as it requires the computer to use human reasoning or thinking to perform tasks. And we like to caveat that the second sentence here is aimed a little bit more at a more futuristic uh, element of AI that we are, we're slowly broaching this area of, of our computer reasoning and computer thinking um, to replicate uh, on par a lot of, of, of human tasks. And so uh, we're not always quite there yet, but I think we can see in a lot of the, the technology that we do encounter that these computers, uh, that these technologies are advancing quite quickly. Um, and so one of the things that we like to show is our actual framework of AI. And so uh, Sandy will talk about this a little bit later when we talk about our workshops. But when we do show our framework, we like to introduce AI as a family tree. Um, I know some of the analogies up there will compare AI to a person. So you think that, you know, a person can speak, they can talk, they can see, they can make decisions. And those are all the different types of things that, that AI technologies are trying to replicate. And we kind of like to see it more branched out as, as a family tree. So we have artificial intelligence joining with machine learning, joining with data science to produce many different subsets of AI. And that's one of the important things that we really started to push is having conversations about these subsets. So let's talk about predictive analytics and recommender systems in uh, libraries, because that's a huge part of our journal databases now. 
Um, or we can talk about neural networks and deep learning to be able to catalog and classify information and to be able to parse and make decisions about uh, things that we might make choices on. Um, uh, where Sandy and I are mostly focused is within natural language processing, uh, specifically within things like text generation and question answering. Um, we are, that's, that's usually where a lot of the virtual uh, assistants uh, live, but then also the tech that's powering that is coming from speech and vision or speech to text and text to speech. So you can see how AI is not just one thing. We don't just have an AI. We have all of these different technologies that make up a larger umbrella of AI. And so that's what, what we want to start doing is, is having these smaller conversations about these different topics and, and making people feel more comfortable with speaking about neural networks versus just AI or talking about machine learning or deep learning um, and not just AI, like we said. So really getting people comfortable with that. And one of the ways that we do that is through our workshop series, which Sandy will, will break down in a little bit. And so uh, just to kind of touch into the research, um, one of the things that we did was our environmental scan. So to kind of take a deep dive into how universities were planning for AI, we did a survey of North American libraries um, to see, you know, how we felt. And um, we did this from yeah, July 21st to September 6, 2019. We had I think 163 full responses from academic librarians. Initially, we tried to do the survey as wide as possible. So we were looking for public librarians, special government, health, like anything and everything we could get. And we just wanted to see what responses would come back. And in the end, to make the, the survey as, um, as accurate as possible, it turned out to just be an academic library focus. Um, but we did get some really interesting information out of some of the other other data. So hopefully somebody takes that up to look at how other librarians outside of academia are interacting with AI and, and how they feel about it. Um, but our research questions, what we were really, like I said, what we wanted to know was how did librarians perceive artificial intelligence? Um, because, it, you know, we're so caught up in that that larger broad term of AI. We know that not a lot of librarians um, even know that they're interacting with it sometimes. So we, we wanted to see how they were perceiving it. We wanted to know if librarians were conscious of the fact that they were using AI technologies. And we wanted to know if they had been providing any support around AI technologies, whether through instruction, resources that they were using, um, or, or anything else like that, maybe in the back end. And so we had some really interesting findings from that. And this was in our, our Perceptions of Artificial Intelligence paper, which uh, I put a citation in here if anyone wants to, to read the full thing, but I'll give you some of the highlights um, right now. So we found that 77% of librarians indicated personal use of AI at home. Um, and so this struck us as like really, really interesting because as a librarian, I don't think you can actually get away from AI. <laughs> it is in everything that we do inherently, even if we don't know it. I mean, you could say that you interact with artificial intelligence just through doing a Google search. You know, um, you can interact with AI just from using the databases in your library. So it's one of those things that really opens up to the fact that, um, you know, at home and at work, people might not even realize that they're interacting with artificial intelligence as, as only 77% uh, had indicated. Um, and then we also wanted to look at how librarians were interacting with virtual assistants. And we found that only 60% indicated that they used them. Um, and that was really interesting to us um, just to see that number kind of grow because we've noticed like the large trends in purchases of smart home devices in the use of Siri. And I think it'll actually be interesting to see in a kind of, I don't know if post COVID is the right word, but a post COVID world, how interactions with these types of devices have grown. You know, people have had more time to sit at home and test things out and, and kind of grow that algorithm and decide, maybe I do want to play around with Siri a little bit, or maybe they've gone in the complete absolute opposite direction where they're now completely terrified of this technology and they don't want it tracking them. They don't want to interact with it or, or feed it any data. Um, but at this point, we found that about 60% of librarians were interacting with virtual assistants in one way or another. And then we found that only 8% believed that uh, AI was being used in their library. So this is a, a really nice kind of comparison about 77% of librarians using AI at home. Um, so as we all know, it, 
AI is, is pretty entrenched in, in our digital world. It, it's very hard to escape. It's in Netflix, it's in Pinterest, it's in Amazon, if you're making purchases there. Like I said, it's in all almost all of our resources, our subscriptions that we subscribe to for, for databases. So to say that we're not uh, using AI in our libraries is kind of a huge eye opener that only 8% only believe that they were actually uh, consciously using it. Um, so that told us we probably need to do a lot more outreach about artificial intelligence libraries because people might know that they're using recommender systems. They might know that they're using um, computer vision to do digitization, but they might not realize that that is actually a component of AI. And so that kind of gave us a direction of where we should probably head with some of our, our future planning. And um, kind of strikingly as well, only 20% of librarians believe that their patrons were interested in using AI. And so this here is, I think, really going to set up um, a good kind of um, a good mirror to when we do our student perception survey to see how our patrons, our students or community um, wants to interact with AI if they have the desire to do that. Um, but the fact that that only 20% believed that that people were interested uh, seemed a little startlingly low to me but at the same time also quite high for the fact that uh, we later found out that not a lot of people were actually doing AI programming so 20 percent is is you know it's not it's not completely high but it's not an insignificant number either that's you know one fifth of your your population is potentially like interested in taking advantage of a survey and I think as librarians we can all agree that we've done way more for, for way smaller groups of people. So it seems to me that we should be jumping on this, but also that those numbers should be growing. Um, and of course, uh, where we get into our virtual assistance area, 36% uh, believe that AI could replace a librarian's job. And there was actually um, a really unique study that came out in the UK, um, actually that compared like thousands of different professions and the likelihood that these would be um, we replaced by AI and I believe librarians uh, fell somewhere around the 60% range that we had a 60% likelihood. Uh, so it's interesting here that only 36% believe that their jobs would be replaced. Um, now Sandy and I, I think are very much in the camp where we don't think our actual jobs are gonna be replaced, but rather maybe some facets of what we do could be supplemented with AI, but that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to lose our jobs. It just means that we have to learn to coexist and interact with AI in different ways. So it was it was good to see that you know people were a little bit more optimistic about about this question here. Um, but oddly enough, fifty percent believe that AI could provide accurate reference assistance. So this is uh, a big part of what Sandy and I are getting in the device testing, um, which kind of all started out with just asking Siri and Alexa and like Google Assistant random reference questions to see if they could answer it. And, and you know, when we would kind of just ask people casually as, as we started this project, a lot of people were like, no, no, Siri can't answer something like that. And, you know, then we started testing it and we're like, oh no, Siri can't. So can the Google Assistant. It's, it's, it's crazy how smart these devices are getting. And it seems like you, you think we would know that ahead of time. Um, but so it seems like librarians are a little bit on the fence. So perhaps half of us thinking that AI and it, uh, specifically some of those programs like the virtual assistants could do reference work. And then the other half quite not quite so sure that it would be up to par with like a, a reference, um, reference interaction. So that was uh, some of the more, I think, interesting findings of, of our survey. Um, and we had some really great um, questions that came out. I think we had asked people to provide us their own definition of AI to kind of uh, gauge people's understanding. Um, we also had asked people about the programs that they ran in their libraries. And there's a lot of questions about AI ownership as well. Um, so not a lot of people were sure whether or not like their libraries could constitute using AI or owning AI because it was part of something that they were subscribing to or something that like they used because it was free on another website and whether or not that belonged to the library. Um, I like to think that if you're out there, if you're consciously using it, if you understand how it's going, that, that you can say that you are actively using AI in your library. Um, that's, that's part of the camp I belong to, I think. <laughs> Uh, but this is uh, kind of the core of our, our survey here. Um, and the flip side of that is how libraries themselves are interacting with 
AI. And so this is the environmental scan that we did uh, where we wanted to see if libraries were strategically planning for AI. Is, uh, and this actually took place a little bit before our perception survey came out. Um, so it was, it was interesting to see uh, the results of the survey and then how they, they matched up to the perceptions here. And so this we actually did uh, the summer of 2019. So right before we released the survey, we evaluated 27 research intensive universities in the US and Canada. And so we used the U15 in Canada, which is a group of 15 research institutions, um, sometimes known as like maybe like the top schools in Canada um, because of that. But it also depends on, on other rankings as well, but it's a really good benchmark for trying to figure out who has research intensive programs. And to kind of compare that, we use the Times Higher Education Top 10 Research Institutions in the US. Um, and then we added in the University of Rhode Island and Oklahoma University during a uh, second round of reviews, uh, just because they had been pinpointed as heavy AI users in their libraries. And we wanted to see if that made any kind of difference when we, when we compared them to the top research universities. And so we scoured every single strategic plan, mission statement, anything to do with emerging technologies to look for terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. We wanted to find if there were AI hubs, labs, all that kind of stuff. Um, we looked through subject guides. We looked to see if there was workshops being offered on AI, like were people explicitly uh, providing programming? Um, was there, you know, tech that could be rented uh, or borrowed or any of that kind of stuff? And we also took a look to see the larger university presence. So was the university offering, you know, courses on AI? Did they have uh, prominent researchers in the field, that kind of thing, just to make sure that there would be a connection. And uh, here you can see the list of schools that we um, actually took a look at. So our first two boxes here are the U15 in Canada and then our top 10 in the US plus Rhode Island and Oklahoma. And what we found was that no strategic plans actually mentioned AI. So there were no, no planning, no documentation around AI. We found that um, additionally, there was no programming um, explicitly. I think there was about five, um, or sorry, there the five programming, but no like events, no, no workshops, um, things like that, that, that explicitly called it out. But we did find uh, the Stanford University Library had an AI digitization project going on. Um, the Rhode Island University Libraries actually does have an AI lab that they had been building at that time. Um, but again, it, it's nowhere in their documentation do they provide goals or you know strategies for how this is going to work. And so you can see that like some of the grassroots AI stuff is happening, um, but it's not quite making its way into overarching like administration planning for libraries, which is where we think some of this should be coming. Um, and interesting to know that all, all campuses did offer um, a heavy AI presence. They had distinguished scholars, they had programs, hubs, student groups for AI. So there's a lot of demand for artificial intelligence, like information on university campuses, but only five libraries that we found were even kind of touching on it. And that was just in the, in, in the small subset that we looked at. And we know that there's a lot more doing kind of, like I said, those, those grassroots efforts. But the thing about that is that they don't make their way into, you know, the larger library ecosystem as quickly or, or as visibly. And so they're a lot harder to find, a lot harder to pick up people who are doing things. Um, and that was a couple of years ago. So we've definitely seen a huge boom in AI activities since then. Um, and actually one of um, one of my favorite ones that we found was the 99 AI challenge at the University of Toronto Libraries, which actually launched, I think it was like two months after we finished doing the scan. So it couldn't even be included in the project um, because at the time they didn't have anything to offer. And then a few months later after, after the research was finished, uh, the University of Toronto came out with this huge program where they brought in 99 faculty, students, staff, community members to do like a big learning discussion forum throughout the year to discuss AI, its impacts, benefits, uh, potential fears, uh, policy changes, all that kind of stuff. So it was really cool to see this huge library event happen. Um, but it's just a shame that we it just missed the, the frame of our, our methodology there. Um, and I'm actually going to flip gears and turn this back to Sandy. So we kind of took a look at the state of AI um, in terms of libraries, how they're interacting with it. We looked at patron perceptions and Sandy's just going to touch on our, um, our 
workshops. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Amanda. So this research, so both our environmental scan and perceptions from librarians um, kind of got us thinking and specifically Amanda um, came up with the idea that we should do a workshop to tell people a little bit more about AI. So I want to preface this by saying that we are not computer scientists. So we were not going to go into a backend black box, how does AI actually, actually work on a computer science basis? We really wanted it to be open to everyone, no matter the faculty, no matter the background, um, anyone could come to the workshops, learn more about it if they had an interest and participate um, in discussions. So if we go to the next slide, um, thank you. So it's actually a series of three workshops um, just because there's so much content, we didn't wanna just cram it into one. Um, so it's three. So the first workshop focuses on AI literacy. So the terminology around AI, that great family tree that we'll go back to in a minute, um, but really helping people gain a, ba a basic understanding of AI. Um, because sometimes with sci-fi and, and movies, people think of AI as, you know, the Terminator or things taking over the world. Um, they don't necessarily think of it as, oh, it could be part of Netflix recommending new movies to me. Um, so kind of bringing it down to a more manageable level for people to understand how it's actually used in everyday life um, and also the impact it can have on, on library research. Um, and what we've done is created a tool to help assess information about AI. Um, so if you're familiar, a few years ago, librarians in the US created a tool called the CRAP test to help people evaluate information, right? Um, so it's, it's an acronym and stands for the various things that people should look for. So we kind of took that basic premise, but turned it into something that would be more appropriate for AI specifically. So when the people are reading information, you know, in the news or hearing about it, finding an article, um, what different aspects they, could, they should look for and what should they question as they are hearing about AI and learning about it. So that was our first kind of workshop to make sure that people were on the same level and understood what it means. Um, I should say too that um, people didn't have to take these in order, right? If you were interested in ethics and bias, you could come to the ethics and bias and we always had the beginning, have a short introduction to that terminology to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, so the ethics and bias ones really looked more into the policies on AI, personal information, uh, and it was really discussion and case study based. Um, and people were really willing to engage. So that's the thing we found with all of these workshops is that we'd booked, I think the first one we did in person, uh, when we could do workshops in person, uh, we'd booked two hours, but even with two hours, like people were, were, were talking in their groups at their tables, they wanted to exchange on these topics. Um, so people are really engaged and really willing to participate, which is great. Um, so the ethics and bias one got a lot of really interesting discussions going. Um, it's also interesting that we got feedback. So some computer science students actually attended um, and they really mentioned to us that these issues are not discussed in their programs. Um, like they learn how to code, they learn to do computer science, but they don't actually talk about the ethics and bias of it, which we thought was quite interesting. Um, so it's clearly filling a need. Um, and the last workshop focused on AI in research. So not research on AI, but how you can use AI in your research. So if you wanna use some AI tools or systems um, to kind of augment your research processes. Um, so which tools are around and are already being used. Um, so we give some examples um, and also how you would want to include AI in the research process and how to acknowledge it. So if you're gonna create a research plan or a data management plan, um, similarly, how you, would you acknowledge the use of AI? Um, within your research. Um, so we offered the first workshop in early March, 2020. So we were just under the wire to do it in person. Um, and like I said, we had a lot of engagement. We had students from a lot of different faculties, um, undergrads, graduate students. We also had a lot of people from the McGill um, lifelong learning community. So maybe very often like people who've retired and decide to take classes um to keep learning things so we had a lot of people from that 
um, alumni, like all the different programs of Miguel um, and different types of members from the Miguel community. So it was really interesting to see all these people kind of come together to talk about this. Um, we did have to move it online because of the pandemic, um, which means we could, yes, reach maybe more people, but it's a, a little bit different to try to have a live discussion online as opposed to in person. Um, so we'll see how that goes when we hopefully can go back in person. But we got a lot of participation and involvement. Like I said, we did um, have 76 participants. And given that it's the first time we were offering these, uh, we're pretty happy with it. But we had a lot of engagement. Um, so if we go to the next slide, so this is again, our great family tree that we present every workshop to make sure that everyone has a like base understanding of what the terms that we use are and what they mean and how they rely to, to each other, right? Um, and then, so this is a look at the evaluation tool that I mentioned. So we called it the robot um, because I thought it was quite fitting. Um, so it stands for reliability, objective, bias, ownership and type. So how reliable is the information shared about the AI, right? Are you reading it um, in a newspaper? Is it coming from the company? Um, like how reliable can you, can you actually trust what's being written about it, right? Um, because sometimes if we read maybe more popular articles about AI, very often they tend to be either like very doom and gloom or this is gonna save the world. So sometimes there's not necessarily a lot of gray area. Um, and then objective, what's the goal of the actual AI? So what is it trying to do? Um, and what's the goal about share, of sharing information about it? Um, what could create bias or potential ethical issues within an AI? And that's where like a lot of discussions came up with you know, facial recognition softwares and privacy, like those sorts of things people were very engaged in. Um, who's the owner of the AI technology because that can really impact who gets to use it, um, who gets to access it. And again, with facial recognition softwares, like there were some companies who were making it available to say um, police enforcement, but they were talking about making it available to the general public as well, which you know causes a lot of uh, concern. Um, so those kinds of, of issues we, were, we would discuss. Um, and then type, so which subtype of AI is it? So that's where we go back to kind of the tree that we were looking at. Um, and is it more theoretical or applied, right? Because some articles will describe things that could theoretically be done by um, like AI or all powerful AI systems, but we may not be there yet. So that's important for people to be aware of the difference between the two. Um, and we had some like really great conversations around all of those points, but it's just to give people kind of markers of what they should look for and what they should question instead of thinking of things as all, all black or white, right? That there's um, a gradient of information in this. Yeah. Um, and so if you are interested in learning more about um, different AI kind of applications in academic libraries because we got really interested in this. Um, we actually edited a book with ACRL, so the Association of College and Research Libraries. Um, it is in production, so hopefully it will be out <laughs> at some point. Like, um, our shameless plug, and there is a chapter yeah. <laughs> on the National Archives of the UK, so represent. Yes, there is. Um, <laughs> But there's actually some of the really great things that we talked about, like the 99 AI challenge, the University of Rhode Island AI lab. Um, there's some really good, some good stuff in here, both backend and um, like user services that we're really excited to share with people. Yeah, that actually brings good. us to our interactive portion um, of this thing. So before we get into some discussion questions, I wanted to give everyone a chance to actually do a kind of modified version of a Turing test. Uh, so if you've never done a Turing test before, or if you haven't heard of them, um, it is a method of examining an interaction with a computer to try to determine if you are talking to a computer versus a human. Um, that's a, a very, very kind of watered down uh, explanation of a Turing test. And so what we have here is actually a reference question that was asked to a McGill librarian on our virtual chat system, which we then asked to Siri and we asked to Google Assistant. So I'm gonna present 
three different scenarios to you now, and we're going to see if we can figure out which one was the librarian. And we do have a Mentimeter poll for people to put their answer into. So I think the link there is in the chat. So you can pull up the link to the chat or the link to the poll and uh, we'll go through these. I'll give a little bit of time. And if you need to like go back to see a slide, just let me know. Um, but so each interaction uh, is the same. So this is scenario one. And so our user is asking how to cite a website in Chicago and the librarian responds, here is a link I found for citing a website in Chicago with a link to Purdue OWL. Uh, now Purdue OWL in uh, North American academic libraries is a pretty, um, pretty standard uh, source for, um, for information on citations. I don't know if it's the same in the UK. So I just wanted to clarify that this is a, a pretty scholarly academic source that, that would be provided. So this is scenario one. I'll just leave that up there for a second for people to, to take a look at. And here's scenario two. So same question, how do I cite a website in Chicago? And the librarian responds, citations for a website in Chicago include first name, last name, uh, quotations, uh, title of the web page, publishing organization or name of website, publication date and or access date if available, comma URL. After it has been used once in your reference list, it can be last name, comma shortened title. More information can be found here. And this is a link to a university uh, library website on citations. So our third and final scenario, the user asks, how do I cite a website in Chicago? And the librarian responds, here's a link to the Chicago Manual of Style you can access online. And it's a link to the same Purdue OWL page. So I'm just going to pause sharing my screen for a second just to make sure I don't reveal the answer as I go. Um, but you do have the Mentimeter um, poll in there. So I'm going to resume sharing. Oh, and it looks like some people have already filled this out. Perfect. So everyone should be able to see my Mentimeter screen. Sandy, can you confirm? Yes, perfect. Okay, so it seems like most people think act, uh, scenario two was with the librarian. Does anybody need me to put the scenarios back up on the screen or you feel like you got a good enough understanding to, to think which one might be which? Okay, well, would it shock you to know that, let me press enter here, it was actually scenario number three was the real librarian. So, Interestingly enough, scenario one was with Siri, which if you take a look at the uh, like the text of the answer, you can kind of get that Siri feel for it. The here is the link um, the response. Scenario two was Google Assistant. And I do want to kind of preface when we asked it this question, um, I used both my smart speaker device and the Google Assistant app on my phone. And the Google Assistant phone app, when it gives me the answer to this question, it actually brings up a picture of how a Chicago website is cited and step by step will break down where each part of the citation goes in both the long form and the short form before providing you a link to a library website. And the third answer was actually from a librarian from our own virtual reference service. Um, and so you can see that the, they had kind of just given the OWL link. There was a longer conversation where they asked about other things that weren't related to citations, but that was the citations part that I took out of that conversation where it was, how do I cite this? And <laughs> that was the link sent. So oddly enough, it was, uh, it was number three was the real librarian and scenario two, which most people thought was, was the human was actually Google Assistant. 
And uh, when Sandy and I um, did our device testing, we were like startled by how well the Google Assistant, the Google Home could answer a lot of these reference questions. Um, and uh, as I see a, a chat there, it's reassuring to know someone other than librarians are using them guides. And that's actually part of the, the results that we found was that Google Assistant is really good at offering up libguides as like information access points when you ask it questions. And part of what we want to know is that is that because it's us who's asking and you know we tend to search for libguides or, or other people's library uh, pages, or is this going to vary by person? And so when we do device testing, we want we want to include students, we want to have, you know, completely blank profiles, we want to have users who are heavily invested in their virtual devices who search, you know, pages, we want to see how those answers vary depending on who's the person asking the question, you know, what their Google algorithm or their Siri is, is kind of set to, to give them. Um, but it was it was impressive, the the ability for, for Google Assistant to answer. Um, so thank you for participating in our, our little tests. Um, Hopefully now maybe you'll be one of those people who believes that virtual assistants do have the ability to answer reference questions. <laughs> maybe that 50% uh, that we looked at is, is shifting. Um, no, we do have some discussion questions here. I'll let Sandy take it away, but also um, I believe uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A part. And if anyone wants to ask a question live, you would just raise your hand and you'll be able to, I think, turn on your mic and your, your video and Sandy and I are happy to answer, but we do have questions for you in case anyone needs a little nudge. Um, thank you. Yeah, so these are essentially just um, little questions to get you thinking. So feel free to discuss or ask questions about whatever you like. Um, but we were curious to see what are some of your own perceptions of AI? Um, is AI included in your strategic plan or maybe it will be now? Um, or how could you perhaps include it? Um, which AI applications do you use at your library? Are they more behind the scenes for cataloging, metadata? Maybe you're using linked data, um, or is it more like the, on the user side, right? Like workshops or, or reference services, chatbots or something I'm looking into as well. Um, and do you have any AI programming in your own library? Um, but if not, feel free to ask us any questions. I do see that there was a Q&A from earlier. Um, so could the ability of machines to make intelligent decisions be risky without having human emotion? Um, I would just say yes. I would flat out respond to yes. That would be very risky. Um, Sandy and I are really interested in human-assisted AI uh, specifically. And I think that's a huge trend in a lot of AI research right now is having you know human uh, either explainable AI or human assisted AI so making sure that there is a human element in any decision making processes um, I actually attended an open AI discussion held by the government of Canada where they were pooling people to kind of see how they interacted um, with AI but also what we thought about policies and there were a lot of scenarios where they presented to us like if you know AI was used to make decisions regarding immigration or re regarding any sort of government processes, how would that work and, and what kind of human element would be involved? And it was, it was really, I guess, positive to see that like that was in the forefront of discussions. So like, how do we integrate humans into each part of this? Which is why I don't think librarians are gonna lose their jobs anytime soon. There's always gonna be a human element to it. Yeah, um, I think someone's asking in the chat too, um, that if you're using those virtual assistants, um, and it's a speaker and it reads the URL to you, it's not very useful. Could you send the link? Um, actually, most of those, so when you use a Google Home, for example, yes, I speak to my speaker, um, but there's also an app. And in the app on your phone, it would send you the information. So very often it will send you, like Amanda said, that guide or like kind of like a screenshot or a link where you can see the answer um, in the guide. So there is a way for you to find it again or follow the link through the information. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really neat. Yeah. Just to uh, jump in briefly, I've seen there's been a few comments coming in that have gone only to panelists. That may have been intended that way and it's fine, but just wanted to say if you want to share something in the wider chat, make sure that you uh, click the box for all panelists and attendees if you want everyone, everyone to see those. Um, 
I have a question, if I may, and I've sort of been, been reflecting on something that you said, or rather some of your survey results, where only a very small number of librarians um, said their library is using AI. What I would find really interesting is, is there any way to find out how close to the reality that actually is? I mean, I know you've, you've looked at the websites and so on, but um, I think strategic plans may or may not tell you what systems are being used. And the reason why I'm asking this is in a way, so you've just asked the audience, is your library using AI? But interestingly, if we don't know that systems that we have are using AI technologies, how can we be aware of what the risks and benefits are? And so building onto this, is there perhaps a risk that we are not aware of how machines are making decisions already? And how can we deal with this? Yeah, so I mean, to, to kind of jump to the last part of that, yes, there is a huge risk that we're not like we're not well enough aware. And that's, I think, a huge part of why we're doing these AI literacy workshops is to start providing more opportunities to become aware and to become part of that conversation. Um, I would say to them that my question would be to everybody, if you're not sure whether or not AI is a part of your library, um, I would say, do you have a digital scholarship presence at your, your institution? Do you have any kind of maker space where you interact with, with certain technologies? What are those technologies? And start thinking about, you know, some of those like data visualization software and tools that you might recommend to users or that you use for your own work. Consider, consider those. Um, I think Sandy and I come from that user services perspective. So we tend to think mm -hmm. of those things first. Um, I did see somebody mentioned um, in, in one of those comments about using um, uh, sort of scanning material for an OA repository for, I think it was, um, sorry, so to scan digital heritage, create an OA picture repository, uh, someone had sent to us. And so for something like that, um, there's a lot of a lot of AI applications going on in the background that like Sandy and I don't always get to interact with, but that we know are happening at our library, but maybe those librarians working with them don't understand that they're they're using artificial intelligence when they are interacting. Mm -hmm. So that becomes, I guess, part of the conversation that we want to spark is, is who is, I guess, conscious of what they're using? And if they're not, how can we ask them other questions? So that would be like the next thing that we would do is ask you about your makerspaces, ask you about the resources that you interact with. What do you do behind the scenes, what do you promote for patrons? And then we can start to figure out what of that is AI and how do we make ourselves more aware of it? Um. And I think like slightly different, but someone was asking in the chat about the risks of disinformation when using smart speakers to ask questions and do research. Um, and that's something I was really interested in because I'm a librarian for religious studies. Um, and we know that if we research anything related to religion online, depending on which religion it is, um, there, you know, it could be prone to disinformation or you know, even slander in some cases and just false information. So I was really interested in seeing how we would respond to some of those questions. Um, and that's why I think it's important, like Amanda said, to really engage in kind of educating people and providing instruction about this, because much like, you know, even if you use a scholarly research database, you could find predatory publishers, you could find research that has not been vetted properly, right? So you still need to have an element of evaluation to it. Um, and it is much the same for smart speakers, right? It's one thing if I ask it, um, like, I don't know, how long do giraffes live? Like a basic fact, factual question. It's another one if I'm asking for information to create and build an opinion in a research paper. So we really emphasize that evaluation element. And like Amanda said, that's why I don't think we're going anywhere anytime soon because so much of our job is showing people how to find and evaluate information. Yeah, we don't stop being information literate just because we search in a different way, I guess, or that we interact with technology in a different way. Thank you. I think there's probably quite a few more questions I could ask about bias, but we have a few more Q&As from the audience. So one um, question is, I'm interested in the role librarian, <coughs> librarians could play in building AI behind the scenes. I understand that AI learns from constantly asking questions to set context and build its own future connections. Do you think librarians could have a role answering AI questions in the future? So I guess this is probably a question aimed at our role in training AI to make it more useful and help it learn better. I think so, 
personally, and, and I think Sandy would agree that, you know, we have huge corpora of like data and, and, and just like information sets that could be used to help train AI. We have, we have a lot of training data, uh, I'll say. And so to become more involved in that, I think would be really great for libraries. I think there's maybe like risk aversion and hesitancy. There's also privacy uh, considerations to be made um, when it comes to how we use that data. But I believe that librarians should be, you know, when, when they're able and if they're interested, should be actively trying to participate in those conversations. Yeah, and I think specifically for, we've been doing a lot of research with voice assistants and, and reference interactions specifically um, is a big of area of research of mine as well and virtual reference. Um, and so far, like those virtual assistants are great if we ask them a question, like how do I cite something in Chicago? And it, it will give it to us, but it's not going to engage in what we tend to call a reference interview. Like it's not going to, you know, ask about is it for a class like how many sources do you need what kind of sources do you need like it's not going to engage in that kind of more in-depth um querying unless that, I well, do. unless unless yeah Which so that's is something that I'm working on. yes that's what amanda's working on but um that is something that librarians could help inform right is that um providing that kind of knowledge Thank you. We've uh, since I have two more questions, um, and as we are sort of slowly coming to the end, I'll just maybe uh, read both of them, and then maybe you can you can sort of tackle both um, together. So the first one is: In your review, did you come across any notable examples of AI being developed or used in conjunction with other professional services for research or student support, for example, analytics? And somewhat linked to this, the other question is. What would you recommend as AI services for librarians and users to experiment with and evaluate in an HE library context? So on the one hand, what you have, have you come across in other professional services? And on the other hand, what do you think librarians sh should keep an eye on? Well, I can answer the first one quickly because that has, a, I think, a pretty quick answer. And then Sandy, maybe you want to talk about some of the stuff happening in the Digital Scholarship Hub. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, I, it was not really part of the scan to, to look at some of those, those backend services that were happening. Um, so we didn't consciously pick those up. I have, you know, read articles and seen instances of AI being used, you know, in like grading type decisions or in um, even sometimes like disciplinary type things to look at like plagiarism and cheating, but it wasn't something that we were consciously looking to grab. So I don't have a lot of information on that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like AI services for librarians and users, um, we've seen really a wide variety of what is possible to offer. And I think it can be done at very low cost and it can be done like at very high cost. Like there's a, you know, there's a, a wide variety of what's available. So what we focused on was really things that would just take us our time, for example, like we didn't have to pay for tech. Um, and then you, when you look at other institutions like Rhode Island that are engaging in a very great AI um, hub where people can go and you know have Arduino kits and Raspberry Pis and like all these kinds of different technologies and um, high efficiency computing and all of these things. So they can clearly maybe have a little bit more budget for that. Uh, we went for the lower option, um, but some things we saw that were really interesting were really kind of grassroots initiatives where librarians would start journal clubs just because they wanted to learn more about the topic, for example. And I think that's something we see a lot too, is that um, like specifically user services librarians maybe don't have the knowledge or are not comfortable talking about these topics. Like I know I wasn't because I don't have a background in computer science, um, but a lot of people are kind of educating themselves with journal clubs, having workshops. Um, we have a digital scholarship hub at McGill now where we offer a lot of different programming. So we offer our AI workshops through that, but we also have like digital scholarship, data visualization, um, 3D printing, like all these kinds of things um, through the digital scholarship hub. Um, yeah, so there's there's really a wide variety of what's possible to be done. 